Okay. How about now? It should be okay now. For some reason, when I switch from the starting soon thing to this, the audio decides to go a little bit funny. Though it seems fine now, so I guess I will leave it there. Okay. So, hello everybody that's listening. Which appears to be just me and perhaps one other person, but that's okay. Uh, I'm recording this anyway, so I will put it on my YouTube channel afterwards, so people can watch it back afterwards if there's anything useful in here. So for this week, I mainly just sort of scrolled through Reddit and found some general questions on Ask Physics, not ones sent to me, but I thought I might talk a little about some of them anyway because a lot of them were quite good. But of course, as always, please do just drop a message in the chat about anything you want to talk about. But for now, let me start off. So there was one question from a Reddit user that was asking how important grades are if they want to get a PhD. So they say that they're a European physics undergrad student uh, and they're splitting the question between getting a PhD in Europe and getting a PhD in the US. So they want to know about um, Okay, so they've only just sat their first university exam and they did some linear algebra and they think they did okay on it. Uh, and they're asking about how important grades are in applying to PhDs, is, is the gist of it. Uh, well, grades are certainly important to an extent. They're probably not the most important thing, but it does actually depend on which subfield of physics you're applying to. Um, and which university you're applying to. I mean, ultimately with a PhD, it's a lot of the decision is taken by the supervisor. A lot of the time a supervisor will want to take on a student um, and they'll be the person that's deciding largely uh, who they want to take on. That's certainly the case in the UK. I think in the US it's a little different because they have, you know, admissions panels and when you're admitted to a PhD in the US, you're not uh, immediately allocated a supervisor. You sort of will do some courses and stuff like that. But in the UK anyway, I think a big part of the decision is on the part of the supervisor. So it depends what they prioritize. I think for, for the UK, if you're, I don't know if this person is a UK student, but to, to qualify for funding, I think from STFC, which is one of the main funding bodies in the UK, uh, which funds physics PhDs and science PhDs more generally, I think you need at least a 2-1 uh, by the UK grading system. Um, and a 2-1 corresponds to sort of between 60% and 70% as percentages. Um, so there is sort of a there's sort of a minimum, but I think even that might be something you could get around depending on the funding source, but some funding sources have explicit criteria they want to um, be satisfied. Uh, I think probably the most important thing uh, for applying for a PhD, though, is research experience. So it's if a lot of physics courses have some kind of project in their fourth year. Um, and when you're writing about applying to a PhD and why you want to do a PhD, the project is, is one of the main things you should talk about if you do a project in your fourth year or third year, whatever. Um, but if you can, picking up other research experience along the way is really important. So a lot of the time these are summer projects, people go and do uh, summer research internships. Um, and there's, if you go on my website under the resources tab, there's a few, there are a few links to some different research internships uh, that are offered, just a couple I've put together. So research in internships over the summer are really important and you should do all you can sort of from your second year onwards to try and seek out those, uh, because I think they are very valuable. Um, so yeah, I think I think research experience is, is probably, you know, a lot of people get very good grades. You know, I know quite a lot of people that had very good grades, but still didn't get onto P 
PhD programs. And conversely, I know a lot of people that didn't get such good grades. I mean, my grades were pretty average during my undergrad, not the best. Um, so someone has just sent a message saying, certain PhDs say they strongly prefer if candidates applied in November, but the actual deadline is January, this week and next, actually. Why is that? I'm not really sure, to be honest. Um, I mean, if this is in the UK, I suppose it, it's just because they have to, usually interviews for UK PhDs, well, and US PhDs, actually, usually take place around January, February time. So I suppose by around this time in the year, they probably want to have a good idea of which candidates they want to invite to interview and which they don't want to invite to interview. Um, if they do interviews, because I know a lot of US ones uh, don't do interviews or they, they will still admit people without an interview. Whereas in the UK, that doesn't happen. You, you pretty much always need an interview for a UK PhD. Um, so I suppose it's just a practical concern. Yeah, Oxbridge and London unis. Yeah, so, so from the last application cycle, my interviews happened around February um, in Oxford and at UCL when I applied to UCL. Um, so I suppose it's just, it's, it's a practical fact. They want to know who they've got and be able to take a good time going through the applications before they decide who to come invite to interview. So I suppose they just want it as in as in advance as possible is the answer to that. Uh, what was I saying before? I was saying something, I suppose to summarize the most important thing I, I think for applying for a PhD is talking about your research interests and research experience you have. Grades are kind of the the most basic thing. You can't get into a PhD just on good grades, um, but if you've got pretty bad grades, it might be hard for you to get one, uh, just because some funding bodies do have a sort of minimum threshold, I think, above below which they typically don't or can't offer funding. But that's not, you know, it's not to say if you've not got a good grade, you can't get on a PhD. Um, you know, I know people that have grades below a 2-1 that I said was the sort of standard minimum for funded ones in the UK that have got on funded positions elsewhere. Uh, not in the UK in this case, but still. Um, so yeah, grades are important, but they're not, they're not probably they're not the most important thing when applying for a PhD, but obviously do try and do as well as you can. But some universities do value them more than others, and some supervisors do value them more than others. Um, then somebody else on Reddit I saw posted in Ask Physics and they were talking about they were choosing an elective course so an elective is a course that you can you don't have to take it's one you choose yourself as an option and they're wondering whether to prioritize uh, the subject so how interesting they think the subject is if it's not something they've studied before or prioritizing how good the instructor is how good the teacher is and I think they're just trying to strike that balance to say, you know, should they take the course that sounds most interesting or should they take the course that's done by the teacher that has the best representation or... Hello, hello Pradeep. Uh, take the course that ha is by the teacher with the best reputation or something like that. Um, well, I mean, if you can take both, I think you should take all the courses you think sound interesting but if you have an opportunity to be taught by someone that's a very good teacher, that's also a great opportunity because teachers do have a big effect on how much you like a subject. Um, and if you can get a very good teacher in a subject that doesn't immediately sound interesting to you, that could be a fantastic opportunity to get interested in it um, and to sort of find a niche that you might not have explored otherwise. But I suppose if you had to, for me personally, if I had to, if I was choosing between the two, I would probably choose the subject over the instructor, just because although the instructor is important, there are a lot of different aspects to taking a course uh, at university and studying something. Um, you know, you end up doing, especially at university, you end up doing a lot of independent learning. So certainly what sort of textbooks are available, how good the textbooks and literature are in the subject is also important. Um, and I suppose as well just how it fits into, in general, what you're trying to specialise in, in your degree, if you're, if you're trying to specialise in anything. Um, so I would tend to go for the one that sounds most interesting, or the one 
I'm most interested in taking, rather than um, the one that has the best instructor. Obviously, if it turns out to be a great course which also has a great instructor, then that's you know that's the best of both worlds. But that isn't always the case. Someone has asked about WhatsApp. Uh, I don't really have any opinions on WhatsApp's privacy policy. Um, I'll try and stick to physics. I think that's not something. That's not something I'm going to comment on. Uh, but thank you for the interaction nonetheless. Uh, so there was another question from Reddit, which is a little more technical. So I'll talk about that. Uh, this is an electromagnet electromagnetism problem. So they describe a charged ring, which I'm going to draw like this. And this loop, this ring of charge has got a constant charge density around it. So it's a, you know, it's a one dimensional loop uh, and every sort of little piece of length has, has every, every single fixed length has the same amount of charge in it. Okay. And here, I'm, this is the center of the disc. You've got to imagine you're looking at this from the side, from a sort of angle. So this is a circle, but it looks like an ellipse just because we're viewing it from the side. And the problem is about taking a small charge, little q, uh, which also has mass m, and displacing it some amount from the center of the charge, the center of the circle, I mean. And I'm going to call this little distance Z. Well, that's not very clear, is it? Let's call it Z. Z is the distance away from the center of the circle to where I put this little charge Q. And the thing we want to find is we want to find the force that this charge feels. So if every little length along this loop, let me consider a very small length that I'll call DL. So d, in, d is a differential, it just means a very, very tiny, in fact, a sort of infinitesimally tiny section of this loop. And I want to consider the force that this little piece of loop will create on this charge. So if it has little length dl, as I've written it here, and I'm going to give the whole thing a charge per unit length, sigma. Well, let me do it in orange. Sigma. So what that means is that the charge of this little loop I've this not the loop this little length I've drawn here is given by sigma dl. This is the charge. So let's draw this from the side to get a sort of clearer view. Now, if this particle is being moved out along the center of the the loop, uh, so it's moving along this line which passes through the dead center of the loop. Then we have a spherical symmetry, well, a cylindrical symmetry, rather. Okay, so the only thing we have to worry about are forces in this direction. Because the particle is on this axis that passes through the loop, there's no force pushing up and there's no force, force pushing down. So we only have to think about forces uh, in that position, in this direction. And what we're doing is we're thinking about all of these little segments of the loop and how they are exerting a force on this small charge Q. So this is a side profile here at the bottom and this is the kind of 3D view. So if we think about the force due to one of these little loops, which I call DF, so that is this force here. Well, from Coulomb's law, let's write down Coulomb's law. If you have two point charges, the force between them is given by this expression. Uh, you have some questions on physics space. Can you ask? Yes, of course, please do. I'll just be working through this, but once I've worked through this, then I'll, I'll take a look at them. So thank you. So df, the little force, just due to one of these little lengths along the loop, just from using Coulomb's law here, is given by the charge of the little loop. This can be our big Q if you like. So sigma dl, the charge of uh, the little charge that we're moving away from the center of the loop. So that is little q. And then we have all these constants on the bottom, the four pi epsilon naught. 
And then we have 1 over the distance between these charges. So here, this, these lines are overlapping a bit. This charge is pushing on the little charge, like this. Okay, so we want to find this distance d, the length of this pink line. Here, maybe is a better way of drawing it. So all of these little line segments lie along a circle of a fixed radius r. So we can draw r in here. We can draw z in here for the distance we've moved the point charge away from the center. So then just by using Pythagoras on this triangle, you can say that d squared is equal to r squared plus z squared where r is the radius of this loop, okay? So this thing is all over d squared. d is the distance between uh, one of these little sections of the loop and the small charge little red q. But then we've got to be careful. So these charges are pushing the charge little red q in this direction. But because of the cylindrical symmetry, the only the net force on the little charge red q is along the axis direction and that's because if you imagine for every little line segment here that's pushing the charge like that there's another line segment here which is pushing it like that so all these sort of up and down forces and in and out forces are balanced so it only feels a force pushing it along the direction of the axis so there's a component of the force to consider we have to consider the component of this force here that is going along the axis. So in order to do that, we have to think about this angle theta here. And if we know this angle theta, to find the component of df, that is the force due to just one little piece of this loop, we have to multiply by cosine of theta. Okay, but of course we don't know exactly what theta is yet. You can see that as we change z, if I move the particle out to here, then the angle theta is going to change. So theta will depend on z. And we can work out exactly how theta or cosine theta will depend on z. It's the adjacent length over the hypotenuse length. So cosine of theta is given by z over d. So let's put this into our expression for df, the little force from one single section of the loop. So we have sigma, the charge per unit length, the length of the little loop segment times the charge of the little red charge q here over these constants. And then we have cosine theta over d squared. And cosine theta is given by this, z over d. So that is z over d cubed is our expression. Well, now what? So this is the force due to one small segment of this loop. But of course, we want the total force on the particle, which means we have to add up the force from each of these little loops until when we put them all together we end up forming a loop out of all of these little segments. So we can think about finding the total force as being from summing up, Ooh, that's a terrible sigma, as being from summing up all of these little dfs. But because this is a differential, because it's infinitesimally small, the sum of a differential is actually what we call an integral, which if you've studied calculus is um, totally fine to do, but if you haven't studied calculus, I suppose this is a little bit of a tricky problem because you do need a bit of calculus to solve it, I suppose. So to find the total force F, we have to integrate around this entire loop. Well, we have to do this integral rather, which when we write it out now, uh, in terms of all of these constants, we've got these things which don't at all depend on which segment of loop you're looking at. So the distance d cubed, the distance d, doesn't depend on which piece of loop you're looking at. 
because the distance is the same everywhere, because this thing is located on the central axis of the loop, okay? And I've almost forgot the 4 pi epsilon naught on the bottom. That's important. And then we have the integral of dl. So this is the sum over all of those little loops that make up the circle. So if you sum over all these little loops that make up a circle, sum over the length of them, you just get the circumference of the circle. Oh, I've just noticed that the, the uh, text screen is kind of blocking that. I should move that next time. Oh well. Uh, so this actually just becomes 2 pi r. So we can then write an expression for the force here at some distance z away from the center of the loop but staying on the central axis of the loop the force on the charged particle is given by this expression so this is for a loop of radius r and the particle of charge Q a distance Y away from the center of the loop where this loop has some fixed charge per unit length and that's an expression for the force okay just using Coulomb's law and there's a second part of this question uh, which I'll do in a second but I'll just look at a question in the chat um, so they some Pradeep asked, if the universe is expanding, what lies beyond this expanding edge of the universe? Um, well, it's, it's, it's sort of hard to answer. What lies beyond that edge is not the universe. Um, so it's not something we have any scope or idea about. Um, it's not something physics can sort of tell us about. So people sort of think about the universe as expanding. And they think, well, if the universe is growing, you know, it must be growing into something. It must be expanding into something. Um, but really, that, that's not actually the case. I think the best sort of analogy to think about it is to think about blowing up a balloon. Um, now, the balloon has got, you know, a sort of 2D uh, skin to it. The balloon is this 2D skin, which is full of air. Um, you can think about you know, our universe as being the skin of this balloon. So it's not really um, a case of... Well, what I mean is, um, it's not like there's a kind of edge where if you travelled very far and fast enough, you could get through this edge and you'd reach outside the universe. It's more like, because, you know, if you imagine you're, if you're living in this 2D surface on the outside of the balloon, no matter how far you go, you can't get outside of the balloon you'll you might just come back to where you uh, eventually started um which is is probably not the case with our universe it's probably not closed in that way but i think that's actually not known really um so that kind of picture is not quite right i think the best kind of picture is is like a blowing up a balloon uh where we live in this sort of 2d skin of the balloon so the question of what is the universe expanding into um, is, is not a question that sort of, it's a, very, it's a good question, it's a totally natural question, but it's sort of not one that even makes sense to answer. Um, because it's really, it's, it's beyond sort of definitions of what physics can kind of cope with, probably. That's my understanding of it anyway. Okay, thank you for the question though. So there was a second part to this question now, where instead of thinking about uh, the particle being along the axis of symmetry of the loop, it's now, this is a face-on view where we're looking directly onto the loop, the particle is actually moved to the side of the loop. So this black dot is just to mark the centre of the circle, and the red dot is the charge Q. And just as before, we've got these little segments of loop with length dl. 
and they exert a repulsion on the charge little q. So every single one of these little loops is exerting a force of repulsion on it. And our aim is to sum up the contribution from all of these little loops to figure out exactly what the total force is. Okay. So let's draw a slightly better picture of this. Let's consider the particle here and consider a little piece of loop here. And now I also want to draw some axes. So I'm going to draw these axes in brown just so they don't look too uh, they don't cover too much of the, photo, the the picture. Okay. And in doing this problem, it's best actually to work in polar coordinates. Because this is a question about a circle, and we've got a, a coordinate system at the center of the circle, it's always best to work in polar coordinates in this case. So this little angle here, I'm going to call theta. And now this particular loop of wire is going to exert a force along this line onto this particle. Okay. And again, we can think about what the direction that this particle will feel a force in. So from looking at the symmetry of this problem, if we move this particle just along this line, if we keep considering, it, considering its motion along this line, it's only going to feel a force either that way or that way. It can't feel a force down and it can't feel a force up. And that's because for every little point here, which is sort of pushing it in that direction, we can consider another point on the circle here, which is pushing it in that direction. So this will always cancel. All of the up and down parts of the force will always cancel from the symmetry of the problem. Okay. So let's draw the vertical here because this will be useful. So we need to know this distance big D here uh, because again from Coulomb's law what's important is how far away the charges are from each other to find the magnitude of the force on them. And as before we have a charge per unit length sigma. And also as before we need to be worried about the direction that the force is acting on the little particle Q from. So because we only have components of the force in this direction and this direction, we only need to worry about the part of this force which is pushing that way. And that corresponds to finding this component along here. This is the component of the force we're interested in. So what will end up happening is we will end up multiplying by a sine phi, okay? That's how we'll get this component of the force. But let's just write down the force from one of these little loops. Well, maybe let me write it higher up. Just from one of them. And I'll shift this over a little bit. So again, from Coulomb's law, we need the two charges. We have the charge of the small particle itself and the charge of the little loop segment. So the charge of the loop segment is sigma dl. The charge of the point charge in red is q. Then this is all over 4 pi epsilon naught. And then as before, there has to be a 1 over the distance between the two charges squared. So there's a pink d squared here. But now, because we're only interested in the component of the force along this line, along that direction, we have to take the sine of this green angle, theta. Phi, I mean, not theta, sorry, that's the Greek letter phi. Uh, and that'll give us the component of the force pointing that way. So let's simplify this a little bit. Let's find an expression for sine phi in terms of what we know. So this angle is, this length here is r, this is the radius of the circle, 
and the angle that this line is making to the horizontal we've called theta. Therefore, we can find this length that is the base of this first triangle as just r cosine theta. And likewise, the height of that triangle, so that is joined up to here, is r sine theta. So if we're looking for sine of phi, we need to take the length here of this opposite side and divide it by the length of the hypotenuse. So this opposite side, well, remember the total distance from the center to the charge little red q, oh, I'll read that message very shortly, uh, is z. So the opposite length, sorry, not there, the opposite length here is given by z minus r cos theta. So that is z minus, oh, I won't do it in red, minus r cos theta. That's the hypotenuse. And that is all over the hypotenuse here, d. Okay, so that is what sine phi is equal to. So now we can write df, the force from just one of these little segments, as sigma times q all over 4 pi epsilon naught. And then we have the sine phi over d squared. So the sine phi is given by this here. So we've got a d, 1 over d squared here and a 1 over d here that will make a 1 over d cubed. So this is all times by z minus r cosine theta all over d cubed. Okay. Oh, what did I miss? Ah, I missed the dl here. And there's a dl that I missed from here. So because this problem is uh, involves a circle, polar coordinates are the most simple. So I want to use dl is equal to r d theta. And then when I sum around this loop, because in this case, the angle I'm at actually does affect what the force is. So I can't just sum over just the lengths. Um, I have to keep some of these terms inside of the integral when I do it. So if I write that down, uh, the expression df now in total is exactly what I've got above there, except now there's an r that I'm going to put here, and it's all by d theta. Okay. Oh, Pradeep has subscribed to my YouTube channel. Oh, well, thank you very much, Pradeep. I'll get to your message very soon. And the force, as before, we find by summing over the forces contributed by each of these little loops. So, and this sum, because it's an infinitesimal, these little loops are infinitesimally small, this is an integral. So we have an integral over this whole expression here with respect to theta. Okay, and now we've got to think about which of these quantities inside of the integral change as we change theta. So sigma certainly doesn't, it's the same all the way around. Q doesn't because this is nothing to do with the loop, it's just the charge of the point particle. The radius doesn't because the radius of a circle doesn't change no matter what angle you're at. Um, but D in general will change and we've got to find D now in terms of things we know, so in terms of things like theta. Um, and Z won't change, Z will be the same. So let's go back and find d, and then we will substitute this in. So d we can find from Pythagoras, from this triangle. We have to take the width here squared and add it to the height here squared. So the height here that we're adding, this is given by z minus r cos theta. So d squared will be z minus r cos theta 
squared plus this height here, which is r sine theta squared. And you can simplify this, and you'll have to use the sine squared plus cosine squared is one identity. But when you do that, you get that d squared is z squared minus 2rz, and then there's a uh, cosine theta. Okay, so that is what d squared is equal to. So we have to put that into here, but of course here we've got a cubed. So now this is equal to z squared minus 2rz cosine theta. And this is all to the power of 3 over 2, because it has to be a, a d cubed. OK. And this is actually quite a difficult integral to do. I think actually it's not one you can really do sort of uh, in a closed form, you have to write it in terms of rather tricky functions. So what we can do instead is we can approximate it. We can find out what it does uh, in certain limits. So I think a good limit to think about is when the distance that we move this little red charge away from the center is much, much smaller than the size of the entire circle. So a good limit to consider is when z is much, much smaller than r. And if z is much, much smaller than r, that means z over r <coughs> is much, much smaller than 1, which is useful. So first, we can take all of these constants here out. So we rewrite our integral like this. We have sigma q over 4 pi epsilon naught, oh, well, there's an r on top, and then we have the integral of this stuff here. Okay, that's what we're trying to do. Well, let me draw that in red, because if not, that'll bug me. And we want to find an expression for this integral that's valid when z over r is much, much smaller than 1. So to do that, I want to pull out a factor of r squared from this integral here. Okay. Uh, and you'll see why I do that in a minute. So this is all equal to everything's the same except the bits that aren't. So I'm pulling out a factor of r squared from this bracket here. So that gets rid of an r here. It slightly changes this, it picks up a 1 over r squared here, and it changes this into a z over r. Okay, and then to balance the fact I've pulled uh, an r squared out of here, well, the r squared gets pulled out, um, and then it's r squared, but it's all to the power of 3 over 2. So actually this turns out into us bringing an r cubed outside, like this. So our overall expression now is like this, but instead now we've got an r squared on the bottom, because the r cubed has partially cancelled with the r up here. Okay. And now we've got to think about doing this integral. So we're doing this in the limit that z over r is very, very small because that is really the only sensible limit we can do it in. Doing this integral is a pretty horrible thing to do. And I think if you were trying to do it analytically, it wouldn't be possible without, you know, some sort of special functions and a series solution anyway. So we're only going to look for the first term in the series solution for this. Okay, so if z over r is much, much smaller than 1, well, an implication of that is that z over r squared is much, much smaller than z over r, which in turn is much, much smaller than 1. So you can see that for higher powers of z over r, uh, we're going to get smaller and smaller contributions to this integral. So what we want to do is we want to write uh, an expansion for this denominator 
in powers of z over r, and then we're going to ignore the higher powers of z over r, because these will become more and more insignificant. Okay, so let's do that. So this denominator here, this is 1 over z squared over r squared minus 2z blah blah blah, all to the 3 over 2. So including the fact it's a 1 over, it has a power of minus 3 over 2. And if you expand this out, oh hang on, did I miss something? Ah, you know what, I did miss something. In the d squared, I missed something expanding this bracket out. So this should actually have a plus r squared in it. That's a silly mistake. That just comes from incorrectly expanding out this bracket, but that's only a small error, so that's fine and that's easy to fix. All of these lines here now just need a plus r squared in them. Plus r squared minus that. And likewise for all of these other ones. Let me just quickly add those. And, well, there should also be one up there. Let me change that quickly. It won't take a minute. Okay, there we go. That's fine. Yeah, that's all good now. That one last one. You know, I should have just copied and pasted. Okay. Right. Uh, so, well, this one is also slightly, just need to correct that. There's a plus r squared here. That was the error. Uh, but because it's a plus r squared, and we've divided by... Oh, well, hang on. Oh, bugger. I shouldn't have rubbed that out. So I forgot I'd already divided by r squared at this point here. So these are actually z over r's and z squared over r. Over r squared. And uh, likewise here. Okay. No, don't convert to text. Right. Okay, that's all fine now. This is what we want to do. We want to expand this into my bad. Okay, so I think it's probably nicer to write this like 1 plus this whole thing. And then you can use this, this binomial expansion where you have 1 plus something all to some power. Uh, so to first order, this is going to be 1 plus, and then you need to pick up the power, the power of n, that here is minus 3 over 2. So that's minus 3 over 2 times what is inside here, what was inside with the 1. So that's uh, z squared over r minus 2, z over r cosine theta. And then there are higher terms. There are higher terms which have this whole thing here just squared. <clears throat> but remember, because we said z over r is much, much smaller than 1, uh, z over r squared is going to be much, much smaller than that. And the higher powers we go to, the less this is going to contribute. So we're only looking for the first order thing here. So we're going to put this expansion back in place of this term here that was in the denominator. So we're still picking up everything here except the denominator, because now we're replacing the denominator oops, by this thingy here. So now what's going in here is this thing, which is probably too big to fit, but that's OK. So there's the constant, and that is times by this bit, then this goes in, and we're ignoring the higher order terms. I'll put this in a different colored bracket. And then this is all integrated with respect to theta. OK. Ah, that should be an r squared there. That's a mistake. Not one that's repeated anywhere else. That's good. OK. So uh, the z squared over r term is going to be much, much smaller than the z over r term. Uh, but we've got to worry now about this other bracket that was in the numerator. 
So to worry about this again, I want to take a factor of r outside. And then when I take a factor of r outside, I'll end up with a z over r here, and just a minus cosine theta here. But then I'm going to have to bring a r on top here. So that's going to cancel one of these r's here. So I'm going to end up with this. Same constant as before, but now it's 1 over r. And then that's equal to integral z over r, that should be black, minus cosine theta, and then all the stuff we had in the red bracket up here, <coughs> which I won't write down again, just because it's right there, okay? Uh, and because z over r is very much smaller than 1, z squared over r squared is much, much smaller than z over r. I'm only going to work to the order of z over r. So I need to extract all the terms from the product of this bracket with this big red bracket here, which are on the order z over r. So this term is immediately out, because whatever I do, that's always going to create something bigger than z squared over r. Um, well, bigger than z over r, sorry. Um, and now there are a couple of ways I can do it. So I can take this term from this bracket multiplied by this term here. That'll give me something of order z over r. And then I can take this constant term here and times that by the z over r term here. So there are two ways of getting something on the order of z over r. So I still have the same refactor. And now I have the integral. So taking this first one of z over r from here times by the one from here, that's just z over r. And then taking the constant minus cos theta from here and the e, 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 this term here, the minus 2z over r cos theta, but keeping note of the fact that this is times by a minus 3 over 2. So that's all going to turn into minus 3 z over r cosine squared theta. So this is the integral we need to do, uh, with, that we've simplified down from the horrible one that was impossible to do before. Uh, and we should also now be careful about limits. So, friendly dino has drawn a picture of Bob Ross. Okay, well, thank you. Um, not a very good drawing. I'm not drawing any trees. Well, there's some trees. There, lovely. We've got some trees and, and hills for our, for our physics. Oh, has the stream stopped or is that just me? That's just me. Okay, never mind. Uh, so now we need to do this integral, and uh, as I was just saying, it's crucial to note it's between 0 and 2 pi. Um, because we're going around the entire circle. So this is just a constant here, so this will just pick up a factor of 2 pi, and then we've got to do this integral of cosine theta between 0 and 2 pi. So this constant here is exactly the same, and then doing the integral for this first term, which is a constant, is just z over r times 2 pi. But then we've got to be a little more careful, so now we have to do, uh, we have to be more careful with doing this integral of cosine squared. So now we have integral of cosine squared theta with respect to theta between 2 pi and 0. And integrals like this I always do with a little trick. Oh, Bradley says, I love doing physics out in nature. Yeah, it's a lovely view of some very decrepit black mountains. Um, thank you. Um, so uh, the way I do these integrals of cosine squared theta is a little cheaty way that one of my lecturers just sort of randomly dropped in as a little nugget of wisdom. So if you plot cosine squared theta, it looks something like this, where here is 2 pi, here is pi, and here is 0. So it has height 1, and 
what you do is you draw a box around the 2pi. Oh, hang on, sorry. Um, that is not 2pi there. That is 2pi there. My mistake. So you draw a box from the 0 to 2pi. And then you notice that the area of this box in total is given by 1 times 2 pi. It has total base height 2 pi, total height 1. And then you notice that the area you're looking for, the area under the cosine squared curve, so this half of the peak here and this half of the peak here, is exactly half of the total area because you've got the area of two half peaks added up and then the area of one total peak. And these are the same kind of shapes. These sine these cosine squared curves are, so they're still sinusoidal, so they have the same shape. So you just take the area of the total box, and then you divide it by 2, and that gives you um, the area of half of the box, which is equal to pi. So that's, in my head, how I do these little sort of uh, trig integrals on certain simple intervals. It's not particularly helpful, um, but it's I quite like doing it. So anyway, that's that integral is pi. So we can therefore write down, oops, the entire expression where we replace this integral of cosine theta just by pi. Okay. And this simplifies down quite nicely. You've got a, a 2 pi z over r here and minus a 3 pi z over r. So that all comes out and it gives you a minus pi z over r inside the bracket. So we have a minus now in front of this and the pi is cancelled. So this all turns into minus sigma q over 4 epsilon naught r squared times by z. So that is the force on the particle due to this loop. So a reminder of the problem we were considering we were considering a little charge uh, red Q here that was slightly displaced from the center of a circle. And around this circle, we've got a loop of uniform positive charge. OK, so if you displace it a small distance y away, then for a distance y that is much, much smaller than the radius of the circle, after a, a lot of bother, frankly, uh, we get this expression for the force on the particle, which is proportional to the distance we slightly displace it. And you know that if you have a force that is where the force on your particle is, is proportional to the distance you've displaced it, uh, that is that gives you simple harmonic motion, is the kind of motion that particle has. Okay. So Bradley underscore RL says, I came up with something similar by noting sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. So integrating should get you two pi. And um, because you're integrating over an integer period and sine squared is shifted cosine squared. Oh yeah, it's exactly the same trick. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. Um, so I mean, this curve, uh, you know, you could you could plot the sine squared curve on this. That just looks like a kind of mirror image of this. It looks like a mirror image reflected in the line one half. Um, so yeah, they absolutely will have the same area, just sort of shifted. So yeah, that's a cool comment on that trick. Uh, then there was there was one more technical question I wanted to talk about. Um, though please do put some comments in the chat. I might run over because this that last integration question took a long time. So if you have any other questions, oh well, hang on, there was a question from Radeep, wasn't there? About they say according to me by assumption. There must be some other universe, at least for me, I believe in multiverse. So obviously I think that beyond the edge of our universe, there must be some other universe. Well, some other theories suggest that outside our universe lies a whole sea of dark matter and dark energy, and they're exerting a force on our universe, which has made it expand. Um, well, I don't know. I, I mean, there's a difference between... So, I mean, in, in quantum mechanics, there's something called the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. Uh, and this is just, this is really, this is, it's not a theory, it's an, it's an interpretation. 
and the, the, the reason you call it an interpretation is that actually it doesn't give you anything observable or measurable that you could do to distinguish it from any other interpretation of quantum mechanics. Um, and this sort of says that when, so when quantum, in, in quantum mechanics you have sort of uh, events that are kind of probabilistic and when you make a measurement you sort of, you, you collapse this probabilistic behavior and you, you make a, a, a set observation, a fixed observation of something. And the many worlds interpretation roughly just says that when you, you make this observation, or for all the different possibilities of this observation you make of a particle in some quantum state, um, each result of the measurement sort of exists in a different universe, in a kind of, in a different, in a different world. And every possibility there is to make these measurements, the universe is kind of branched. And there's one universe where maybe you measure, you'd measure an electron with a spin up, and there's another universe where you'd measure it with a spin down. Um, so that is something people talk about in quantum mechanics quite a bit. It's not my chosen interpretation. I think I like uh, the Copenhagen interpretation is my favourite, which sort of just says, well, quantum mechanics is... The interpretation is just, it is what it is. It's probabilistic, that's the way the universe works. Uh, which I tend to favour, actually. I'm, I'm not a big fan of the many worlds interpretation. Um, but this idea you've said about a sea of dark matter and dark energy, that's, that's not something I've come across. Um, I think when you start thinking about theories that go spatially beyond our universe, there's not, there's not much point, because there's nothing you can do to say anything meaningful about them. You can't measure anything, you can't even really do any physics with it, okay? Um, so there was there was another question I found on Reddit where somebody was struggling with pair production reactions. So a pair production reaction is where you have two high energy photons um, and these two high energy photons will sort of interact and produce um, a matter an antimatter particle pair. So in this case, they were considering two high energy photons coming in like this. Uh, and then afterwards, so this is, this is before. And then after this interaction, it forms two particles. It forms an electron and an anti-electron or a positron. And the question was about uh, if you know the energy of one of these photons coming in, so if you know the energy of the first photon, um, how can you work out the minimum energy you need of the second photon such that you can make antimatter, make these particle pairs? Um, because from e equals mc squared, it takes an awful lot of energy to make a very small amount of mass. So they wanted to know how you could figure out the minimum amount of energy to do this. So this is a special relativity question, so this will be a little bit boring if you've not studied special relativity in four vectors, but I thought I'd go through it anyway, because it's uh, quite a nice little question. So we've got the first photon that I'm going to call gamma 1, the second photon I'll call gamma 2, and now I'm going to give this photon here energy E0 and momentum P0. Um, and this is the energy and momentum we know. So we know the energy of this photon. I think in the particular example, this person stated um, this was equal to uh, 10 to the minus 3 electron volts is the energy of the first photon. And then the second photon I'm going to just say has energy E and momentum minus P. So we don't know this energy. This is the energy of the photon we're trying to figure out. And the reason I've given it momentum minus p is just that it's going to the left. So I take positive directions to the right. Okay. And then after we have these this electron-positron pair which are produced. And I'm going to give them energy E plus for the energy of the positron and momentum minus p plus again just because it's going to the left so it's in the negative direction and for the electron e minus 
and P minus. Okay. So uh, within special relativity, instead of just thinking about conservation of momentum and conservation of energy, you can do something a little bit clever and you can think of conservation of for momentum. And this is like the 4D version of momentum where your fourth D is time, so it's three plus one dimensional, people often say. And your four momentum vectors are built using energy as the zeroth component, the sort of time-like component, and then three momentum, ordinary linear momentum, as the one, two, and three components, so it's zero, one, two, and three. Uh, and I should also say throughout, I am setting c equal to one because I am a theorist and I cannot handle anything other than that. But that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do, is to set c equal to 1. And it's a very natural thing to do, so we'll do that. Uh, so let's think about the four momentum before in this setup. So an important thing is that for light, uh, their energy and momentum are, are very closely linked. So for light, the energy of a photon is equal to its momentum times the speed of light, but again, because I've set c equal to 1, I'm just saying e is equal to p. Okay, this is, uh, for photons, this is true. Energy is equal to their momentum. That is for photons. So the initial for momentum, what I'm going to call p mu before, is the sum of the two for momenta uh, this photon and this photon here. So their energies are E0 and E. So I add those up. That's E0 plus E. And their momenta are P0 and minus P. So that is P0 and minus P. So that is the total form momentum before the collision. And now let's write down the total form momentum after the collision. Because just like ordinary momentum, if you're doing a mechanics problem, momentum is conserved. Well, in special relativity, uh, four momentum is conserved in, in a very similar way. So the total four momentum after, well, the energy is E plus and E minus. So that's E plus and E minus. And the total momentum is minus P plus and P minus. So minus P plus plus e minus. Okay, and these are equal to each other because four momentum is conserved. Um, and what we're looking for is e uh, slash p. Now I should have subbed this in earlier. Remember I said e is p, so actually I can replace these e's here, these p's here, just with e's. Place them with e's as in e a s e. Do it with e's, but also replace them with e's as in the letter e. Ha ha ha. Okay, uh, so now we have to think a little bit about physics. So we're trying to find the minimum energy of the photon, the second photon, that will produce these uh, electron-positron pairs. So the minimum energy is the smallest amount of energy we can give to the photon such that it can make the electron and the positron pairs. So if you think about the center of mass frame of the electron and the positron, so after they've been produced, now, if they have any kinetic energy in that frame, that is surplus energy that we've given them that we didn't need to give them. Because the minimum amount of energy we have to give them uh, is only enough to equal their mass, their matter energy, because particles have energy just by having mass, um, which is given by E equals mc squared. But the sort of less cool sounding version where we've set c equal to 1 is just E equals m. So they have energy given by their masses. So in the center of mass frame, so the momentum after the collision in the center of mass frame is given by the energy the particles have just due to their masses. So there are two of them. There's an electron and a positron. Uh, so they both have the mass of an electron. So the total energy is 2Me. And their momentum, their ordinary linear momentum, well, in order to guarantee that we're finding the smallest photon energy that will produce them, we can't allow them to have any additional kinetic energy. 
that will require us to put in more energy than is needed. So they have zero momentum. These particles should be stationary in the centre of mass frame. That's how you find the minimum energy, or the threshold energy, as it's sometimes called. Okay. So if we set P before equal to P after, now importantly, you can only set the four momenta equal to each other within the same frame. So this frame here, how I've written the four momentum before and four momentum after, is in the frame of the laboratory, is in the frame where we've measured one of the photons to have this energy. Okay, we'll measure this photon to have a different energy in the electron-positron's centre of mass frame. So we can set... Oh, I heard a funny noise. Did somebody subscribe? It's not come up for me yet. Slayer Darth is now following. Oh, thank you very much, Slayer Darth. Uh, so we can set the four momentum before equal to the four momentum after. And then there's another important thing we can do. So now, if these two four vectors are equal, for two vectors to be, if two vectors are equal, I can also say that their magnitudes are equal. So now I can also say that the magnitude of the four vector before is equal to the magnitude of the four vector after the collision. I'm doing very well, thank you, Slayer Duff. I hope you're doing well too. And now the next important thing is to look at these two expressions we've got for the four momentum after the collision. So we have, you started learning maths and physics last year for fun. Oh, brilliant, wonderful. So we have two expressions for the four momentum after, one in the lab frame. Oh, sorry, I meant to highlight this. One in the lab frame, which is this one, and one in the electron-positron centre of mass frame. But it actually doesn't matter which frame we're in, uh, in terms of the, ma the magnitude of these four vectors. The length of the four vector doesn't depend on what coordinate system you're using, and it doesn't depend on which frame you're in, okay? Which inertial frame you're in, anyway. So what we can do uh, is we can set the length of this four vector after here has got to be the same as the length of this four vector here, which is just given by 2me. So that four vector there is equal to p after in the center of mass frame as well. This is the next crucial step. Oh, you're working your way through calculus. Oh, excellent. Very good. Feel free to ask any questions. I mean, after I've done this problem, actually, I will be leaving. I've sort of slightly run over my hour, but please do come back on Friday and you can ask me any calculus questions you want and I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, so let's calculate the magnitude of the four momentum before. That's this expression here. So the magnitude of this four momentum is given by this. And remember, when you take the magnitude of a four vector, it is a little bit funny because the zeroth component uh, has a minus sign in front. So this is why this is how it's different from Euclidean space. It's not just a sum like in Pythagoras. If you do 3D or whatever D Pythagoras, there's a minus sign in front of the timelike component. This is what gives you this kind of Minkowski uh, geometry to things. So that is this four vector squared here. And that is equal to the four vector squared after, but because these are four vectors, uh, the defining property of a four vector is that their length is invariant under any coordinate change. So in any frame, these lengths will be uh, the same. So what I can say is that the length of the four vector after is the same as the length of the four vector after in the center of mass frame. And that is just going to be given by the length of this vector here which using my convention that uh, I take a minus sign in front of the timeline component, that is just equal to this, okay? All right, um, and now I can, I can just quite straightforwardly rearrange this for E, because it's E that I'm looking for. We've said that E naught is the vector I know. Uh, so if I expand this out, I get a minus two E naught E, 
and then I get another minus 2 e naught e from here. And the e squared bits will cancel, and the e naught squared bits will also cancel. So that's all I get. Oh, that's another subscriber. What was that? Papusa, pap Papusa underscore Dre is now following. Well, thank you very much. I'm sorry I probably said your name wrong, but that's okay. Well, I hope that's okay anyway. It's okay with me. Uh, so now I just need to do a very straightforward algebraic manipulation to get E, what I was looking for. So it turns out E is given by ME squared over E naught, which is simple enough to compute. Uh, so the, the mass of an electron in kilo electron volts is 511 keV, and E naught, we were told, was, what were we told it was? 10 to the minus 3 electron volts. So if you put that all in, and trust me, I did it. I think I checked the number right earlier. I can't remember. You get 2.61 times 10 to the 14 electron volts, which is a pretty big electron volt. You love the Mario star. Professor Knott is listening to Die Die Dogs. Mario 64 is the best. Oh, I, f I follow uh, Not Prof on here as well. Yeah. I'm glad you like my website. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Great. Oh, please do look at the resources. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I know I like it. I'm a bit of a Mario a geek as well. That's actually on Thursday I do a Mario Kart slash physics chat stream. So if you are if you're interested in Mario Kart as well as physics, come on Thursday at seven o'clock and we'll play some Mario Kart and talk about physics, hopefully. So that was the last question I wanted to do. There were some other nice ones I found on Reddit that were a little more talky, but I think I spent a long time, probably longer today than usual, doing actual worked examples. Um, and it's really annoying. The chat has been positioned in such a bad way the entire time. Uh, I don't have a Discord, actually. Uh, maybe I should make one. That's probably a better idea. At the moment, I have a... You can follow me on Twitter. Uh, I have a, a Reddit where you can submit questions in advance. Uh, certainly, if they're technical questions sort of along... Although this this is not too bad. This is a pretty straightforward one. Um, it would be good if you could submit your questions beforehand. Because then I can make sure I don't muck them up. Um, so yeah, if you go on my About section, you can find my Twitter, etc. But maybe I will make a Discord. That's, that's not a bad idea. Uh, but I think I'll leave it there now. I ran over a little bit, but thank you very much for joining me. Um, please do take a look at my About section and follow me on Twitter. Um, follow me on... Or join my Reddit. I don't really know how Reddit works very well, but whatever you, the correct word is. Um... And yeah, I'll see hopefully some of you on Thursday, where we'll play some Mario Kart and talk about physics. And then back on Friday, where we'll do another office hour, and you can ask me any sort of stuff. Oh, so just a quick last message. Bradley is doing an optics course, an extra material, the derivation of Kirchhoff-Fresnel diffraction formula. Ooh. No, it's not second nature, because I really can't stand optics, but I have done that before. Um, sure, we can, if, if you want me to do that, feel free to submit that on Twitter or Reddit or whatever, and we can have a go, but it might bring back horrible triggering memories of second year optics, which is not great fun. Uh, and Slayer Darth has been, oh, you, Physics O, yeah, no, F Physics O is really great, actually. Um, yeah, I, I, I like a lot of his, uh, yeah, his, his videos on Lagrangians and Hamiltonians are brilliant. Um... Yeah, definitely. If you well, anyone that's listening, also check out Physics O, um, as uh, Slayer Darth has just put on Twitch. He's, he does really great streams. Um, so yeah, we'll leave it there for now. So thanks again. As I said already, check out the About section. Submit some questions on Twitter, Reddit, etc. Uh, thank you very much for joining. See some of you on Thursday for Mario Kart, and then again on Friday for more whiteboardy physics stuff. Okay, thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.